Well, hello, fancy meeting you here. We are talking about Psalm 16 in our five minute study today, and we have quite a bit to talk about, even though the Psalm only has 11 verses. So let's go ahead, not waste any time with my babbling, and let's talk about Psalm 16. Okay, so first of all, the author, this is once again a Psalm of David. We know that from the opening verse, verse uh, one, we also know it because Peter tells us in Acts chapter two, verse 25. There are some significant New Testament references to this psalm in, as I mentioned, the book of Acts. Peter quotes David in Psalm 16 when he's giving his Pentecost address on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes and the invitation is given for people to become a part of the kingdom of God. That's Acts chapter 2. It's also referenced in Acts chapter 13, verse 35. As far as our themes today, the first one is joy and satisfaction are found in the Lord and in his law. Number two, living a godless life promises pleasure, but ultimately will result in a multiplicity of troubles. And then number three, there's a theme here that we are going to talk about quite a bit in our application, future resurrection and power over death. Our definition section is a little bit thick. We've got three words to define here. Uh, the first one, cup. You might be like, why do I need a definition for the word cup? It's because of the way that it's used uh, in, in Psalm. So, okay, a physical cup, we know what that is. It's a container for drinking liquids or holding liquids. But the Bible sometimes uses the word cup in a metaphorical way. Sometimes the word cup is used as a synonym for fate or what will happen to a person in the future, what their future holds. In Psalm 16, David talks about how he entrusted his cup, his future, to the Lord. Probably the most famous occurrence of this kind of usage in the Bible comes from Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, when Jesus prays, quote, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, talking about his near future, his arrest, his, his uh, crucifixion and his suffering. And then we have the word lot. Now, casting lots is going to be something that you're familiar with if you were with us for previous studies, but if you weren't, let's talk about this term, the lot. Casting lots was a way of making a random selection, similar to how we might roll dice or draw straws. Now, nobody knows exactly how the process worked. That's kind of been lost to history or what particular instruments were used to make this random selection, but we do know that God often affected the outcome. Significantly in the history of Israel, when Joshua and the Israelites conquered the promised land, the land was divided up how? Do you remember? It was divided up by casting lots, and the 12 tribes received their land, also known as their inheritance, by casting these lots. So that'll be important. We'll talk about it in the, the um, outline section. Our last definition today is Sheol. We've talked about this several times in Psalm already. It refers to the blackness, the unknown of death and the grave. As I mentioned, we have 11 verses to go over in our outline, just one heading here. Probably could have divided this down into two, but we're gonna stick with one for simplicity. David entrusts his welfare in life and in death to the Lord. So David had observed the world around him and he had observed that there was no good in it apart from God and what God had his hand in. David's delight was in the citizens of his country. He was a king, so he ruled over these citizens, the citizens of his country that loved the Lord. He says that they would be preserved by God, and that was confirmed in the law that God had given to Moses and to the people of David. Now, in contrast, those who abandoned the true God and traded him in for false gods or for you know just worshiping themselves and their own pleasures, they would find nothing but multiplied troubles in their life. David thought so little of these false gods. He tells these people who worship them, he's like, I'm not, I'm not going to participate in your worship. I'm not going to participate in the offerings that you make of blood to them, according to verse 4. And I'm not even going to let their names roll off of my tongue. Verse 5, he says, quote, The Lord, the true God, is my chosen portion and my cup. That's that usage that we just talked about. You hold my lot. David gave his destiny, his future, over to God and entrusted his lot to God. As we mentioned, the Israelite tribes divided up their land. They received their inheritance in the promised land by lot. And David confirms in verse 6 that God had given him a beautiful inheritance, right? The, the lot that God had cast for him, the inheritance that God had given him, it was a beautiful inheritance. And he, uh, his, his inheritance was full of pleasant places. So in giving David this beautiful inheritance, 
uh, God showed that David's trust in him was not misplaced. Everyone should be entrusting their cup and their lot to God and to nothing else. David goes on to express his satisfaction and his confidence in God and the decision that he made to trust him. God was always on his mind, he said. He was always before his face, right? His eyes were always fixed on God and, and on his laws. He figuratively put God at his right hand. Now, we use the phrase like my right hand man, and that's kind of similar, but not exactly. To be at the right hand of another man was to be his most trusted ally, his most trusted protector. He writes, quote, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. This is a very important verse. It's the one that Peter is going to quote in Acts chapter 2, but we'll get to that in the application section. David had confidence that God was going to bless not only his earthly life, as he has already said, but he would also take care of him in his death. God wasn't going to leave him in the dirt to decay. That's not where it all ended. David knew that his story wasn't going to end there. He concludes the psalm in verse 11 uh, with these words, quote, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You know, the way that David talks about following God is much different than the world wants to portray it. The world wants to portray following God as dull and joyless and pleasureless. But David says, no, this is the following God is actually the way to have satisfaction in life, to have your heart filled up with joy and to enjoy the good and steady pleasures of a life that's secured by God. Not only a life on earth, but also a life after death. Okay, so now for our application. As we mentioned in a previous psalm, some of the psalms have dual prophetic meanings, and this one is, um, is, is one of those. Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10, which we just read, are quoted by the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2 during his speech to the Jews when they had gathered during or to, uh, to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. Peter, speaking with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so with the inspiration of God, applied the words of Psalm 16, 8 through 10 to Jesus. And so what is being done here is that David is like a, a type of the Christ who is to come. He's a shadow. Uh, and, and he writes about himself, I think, in the text. That's what we're meant to, uh, to understand. But really, his words have a greater fulfillment in Jesus, in someone who's coming. Peter confirms this. It's not just me making it up. <laughs> Even more so than David, Jesus set God before his face, fixed his eyes on God in his law, in his precepts. God was his most trusted ally and his protector. Even more than David, Jesus trusted in God in his life, his physical life on earth, and his death. Even more than David, Jesus trusted that after his death, his body would not be left in the blackness of the grave. The New Testament, if you haven't read it yet, it's exciting. We'll get there eventually. <laughs> if you have read the story of Jesus, uh, Jesus resurrected three days after his death. His body never saw decay. His spirit wasn't trapped in Sheol. It wasn't possible for death to hold Jesus down. It wasn't powerful enough. And so Peter quotes this text in Acts chapter 2. He said, you know, David, David did die, right? He, he stayed in the grave, uh, but his words have a more powerful fulfillment in Jesus and the Messiah who died. He was the, genuinely the Holy One of God who died, never saw decay, resurrected, ascended to be at the right hand of God. If you want to read about that and the way that Peter ties that into convicting the Jews that Jesus was the, the prophesied Messiah, read Acts chapter 2. Okay, so the, the application for us, uh, obviously there's, a, there's an application in that this shows us the inspiration of the scriptures. David lives a thousand years before Jesus, and yet his words come true in Jesus. But David's prophecy and Jesus' resurrection are what give us confidence that our life won't end in the blackness of the grave. That when, you know, that when we die, that's not the end. That there's a resurrection that we can enjoy if we are associated with Jesus and with his power and with his name. This is talked about in Romans chapter 6, which isn't written by Peter, it's actually written by Paul, the apostle. Romans 6, 4 through 5 talks about the death that we die with Jesus and then the resurrection that we enjoy with Jesus. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism. You know, Jesus died, he was buried in the tomb. Uh, he, Paul writes here, we die to our old self of sin, we're buried in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk 
in newness of life. You have to be born again. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus by water and the spirit. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his.